Imagine if all the systems and the rules that held your country together fell apart suddenly and your family members were all, every one of them, in a dangerous situation. This quote comes from the book, The Translator, written by Dayu Harry. He lived in a small village with his brothers, sisters, and parents. After the Sudanese government sent soldiers to his village looking for rebels, at the age of 13, his family sent him to El Fisher to finish school. While working in Libya and Egypt, he learned English and Arabic. This allowed him to be a translator for the UN and US backed efforts to determine if what was going on in the war was a genocide. Sudanese government didn't allow any journalists in the Darfur region. Uh, so Sudanese citizens who took reporters into the Daipur region, such as Daewoo, were at risk of being arrested, imprisoned, or executed for treason. In the book, the translator Daewoo wrote, wrote about many journeys into, of taking journalists into the heart of Daipur crisis. One ordeal he talked about was his driver, Allah, an American reporter named Paul South and Dalu was captured by the Sudanese army in August 2006. They were held for months when they were, being, they were beaten and deprived. After pressure from the American government, Bono, Pope Benedict, and other world leaders, they were let go. Dalu soon moved to the United States. His main focus of the book was, was and continues to educate the world about what was going on in Sudan, especially in the Darfur region. Before I discuss the turbulent history of Sudan, I will provide you with the demographics of Sudan, which will help you understand its history. Prior to 2011, Sudan was the largest country on the African continent. Its population was roughly 45 million people. The religion consists of 70% Sunni Muslim, 20% Christian, and 10% traditional religion. In South Sudan alone, 114 languages were spoken. S Sudan is home to many ethnic tribes, but I'm going to focus on the Dinka, Nura, Far, and Zajri. When you force people of different ethnic groups to live together, nothing good comes out of it. In 1982, President, the then president of Sudan began redeploying southern troops to the north which violates the Addis Ababa Agreement, which was signed in 1972 after the first Sudanese Civil War. And then on June 5th, 1983, President Newberry established the Republic, one, no, Republic Order No. 1, which invited the, Sudan, the South Sudan into three provinces with separate capitals. He replaced the racial assembly of Juba with three much weaker legislative bodies. He eliminated the separate Southern Army in the South and eliminated representation in the Sudanese Armed Forces. In September 1983, Sudan National Government established a Syrian law, which is Muslim law on all people in provinces, regardless of religion. Uh, Dr. John Grinch was a very important figure to the rebellion movement of the South. He fought in the first Sudanese Civil oh, no. War, but because of his age, he was encouraged to get his education. He received his bachelor's in economics from Grinnell College at Iowa and a doctor from Iowa State University. He liked how the United States government was ran and wanted to bring him back to the Sudan. He attended the Adventist peace, peace negotiation. He disliked the process, especially the mistakes that the South was making and vowed to avoid them in future negotiations. One mistake he noticed from the first Sudanese Civil War was an ongoing division between the military and the political wings. He bridged all three of these gaps. In January 1983, orders from the government for the, Sudanese, for the Southern troops to move north. Gingrich and his commanders refused to comply, and on May 1983, the SAF was sent in to stop the uprise. Major Kripp, you know, and Kanye, uh, commander of the 105th Battalion, fired the first shot and pushed back the SAF. Kripp 
if you know, and his forces joined by Gingrich withdrew to Ethiopia. And on January 31st, 1983, Gingrich became the commander in chief of the newly created People Liberation Army Movement, also known as the SPLA. The SPLA rapidly grew from 600 deserters to 2,000 in 1983 and 20,000 in 1985. His vision for Sudan was a unified but reformed and progressive Sudan, equal democracy for all, and liberation of the entire country. Although the violation of the Addis Peace Agreement was the driven force behind the Sudanese Second War, the humanitarian crisis of 1988 was the final straw. In August 1988, after a three-year drought and famine, a 14-hour period of rain inundated Khartoum and a cattle herding south. The flood led to cattle disease, which was a great majority of, and a great majority of the cattle was killed. As you know, in South Sudanese, 70 percent of the people. Uh, calories came from cattle. Family turned to traditional methods to survive. They would marry their daughters off to receive dowry from their boys' family using 150 cattle. To reduce the amount, the amount of mouths they had to feed, they would send their boys to fend themselves. Refugee camps were set up after the UN realized that the boys between the age of 16, or the age of 6 and 18 was dying in large quantities from the famine but the refugee camps became re recruiting and training grounds for the SPLA. As the famine increased, the UN UNCF, Red Cross, the NGOs, European aid agencies, and the USA tried offering humanitarian assistance. Sadiq government refused assistance because it could, he believed it could break the Gingrich movement by preventing food deliveries to the South. Sadiq and later the Bashur government used displacement, disease, and starvation as a weapon of war to kill off the southern people. He ordered the Mirren militia to burn down every Dinka village to the ground, raping or killing their women and children, raiding their livestock, and murdering their men. If people did survive, they would flee without food and water and would die in the countryside. 1.3 million Southern, uh, Southern Sudanese died between 1983 and 1993. The government also used Dinka rivals to attack the SPLA. He equipped and funded as many as 70 tribes to attack the SPLA. The Dinka and the Nur killed each other and burned each other villages using Northern weapons and equipment. Many people do not know or understand the involvement of the Chinese government in the killing of millions. In 1969 to 1985, the Sudanese government was buying weapons from the Chinese government. The purchase increased in the 1990s due to the internal civil wars among the Sudanese, uh, Sudanese government promised to China international credit derived from its oil production. Since 1995, China has provided the Sudanese government with ammunition, tanks, helicopters, and fire equipment. These weapons were used to kill millions and die for. Not only did China willingly provide guns so that a government could massacre their own people, but participated in stealing oil from the South Sudan. The motivation for arms trade appeared to be primarily economic. China surpassed their peak oil production and relied on its northern province for its energy needs, but it was declining and it needed to find a new supplier. They turned to the Sudanese government. Their need for oil was more important than the lives of South Sudan and later Darfur. The comprehensive peace agreement has six agreements between the South, between the North government and the SPLE. Those six agreements included a national multi-party election, which was held in 2009, but actually occurred in April 2010. In January 2011, the South would vote in a referendum as to whether to secede. 
English, not Arab, was the official language of the South and it was to be used in their schools. The Sharia laws only applied to Muslims and half of all oil revenue from the southern oil field would be distributed to the gross treasury each month. Between 2005 and 2007, $7 billion were transferred from the South government to the North. All SAF troops were withdrawn from the South and all SPL troops from the North. Joint integrated troops, a combination of SAF and SPLA, were stationed throughout the South. Daifur, which is the westernmost part of Sudan, its population consisted mostly of Arabs in the north and mostly traditional tribe. tribes residing in the south. Three rebellions that led to Daifur involvement in the Second Sudanese War. The first one took place in 1987 to 1989, putting the Daifur Arab tribes against the fur. In 1987, the Chayyidian rebels and Libya Islamic Legion were seeking to overthrow President Kabara and move forces and set up base camps in Daifur with financial support, weapons and training backed by Gaddafi, and taxes approved by the Sadiq, then Prime Minister of Sudan. And this rebellion also had a connection to John Gingrich, which was the leader of the SPLA. Dayou Bolin attended the University of Khartoum. In 1973, he became the first non-Arab student association president. He believed that the people supported him and that Sudan was changing, but soon realized that did not signal any, any shift of the underlying prejudice. In 1991, he returned back to Daifur angry and abandoned the Islamic movement. He joined the SPLA and became a commander. He launched a military campaign against the government, but he was severely defeated. No one knows for sure, but it's believed he was executed. Although he was defeated, he was viewed as a hero, and his rebellion led to the first major alliance between the South and Darfur region. The second rebellion took place in 1995 to 1999 and began with the Darfur Arabs and Musulid tribes. During the famine of the 1980s, the Musulid tribe blocked humanitarian aid to the Arab tribes. The government of Sudan deemed Musulid as an adversary and began arming the Arab, Arab tribes to die for. The government exhibited the animosity between the tribes and they began backing the Janjawi, which began attacks on the villages. The third rebellion took place in July 2001 between the when the Fur and the Jajawi clashed to resist the Arab supremacist movement. The long war was interspaced with peace agreements, but on March 18, 2003, a ceasefire dissolved after an Arab militia ambushed a seven year old Misula Sheik on a road to Guinea to Cokeville village. He survived the attack but was later killed by the government. And on March 25, 2003, the rebels seized the town of Time, captured huge stocks of arms and equipment. The Janjawi, which also means they were on horseback, was a militia group backed by the government. The government feared that they were losing their country, provided weapons to the Janjawi, which rich raped women and girls, took anything portable of value. Animals were rustled or killed. Houses was torched, stragglers was shot or stabbed. Sometimes children was tossed into burning homes. In some cases, women were raped with branded like cattle to permanently be visible um, of their humiliation. Other cases, women was abducted, repeated, repeatedly raped, and then released or killed. Villagers was mutilated and their bodies left exposed, tortured, decapitated, school children was chained together and burned alive. In August 2004, 400 villages in Daifur were destroyed. 200,000 refugees crossed into Eastern Chad. 1.2 million people was displaced inside of Sudan. In 2005, the UN International Commission of Inquiry, also known as ICID, 
declared that the government of Sudan violated international human rights and humanitarian law. 544,000 people died, 304,000 from violence, and 240,000 from disease, dehydration, hunger, due to forced displacement. Mortality rates in the refugee camps were 60 times higher than normal. It was caused by acute malnutrition, starvation, dehydration, and disease. People were sent to camps where AIDS delivery system wasn't fully set up. In 2006, the Die for Peace Agreement was signed, and it had five key points. The first point was disarmament and dismobilization of the Janjaweed Weed Militia by mid-October 2006. It placed restriction on the movements of the popular uh, defense forces and required their downsizing. 4,000 former combatants would be integrated into the Sudanese armed forces, 1,000 be integrated into the police force, and 3,000 would be supported through education and training pro programs. The government of national unity, also known as GNU, will contribute to $300 million initially and $200 million for the next two years to rebuild the, re the region. Buffer zones were to be established around camps for internally displaced per people and a humanitarian assistance corridor. Commissions were also set up to work directly with the UN to help people return to their homes. $30 million in compensation to the victims of the conflict. But this agreement did not halt the violence and the suffering of the people. It wasn't unusual for boys to leave home for long periods of time uh, to look after cattle or for school, but would eventually return home. Many of their villages were attacked at night. Some of these boys were away from home when when they did return, they realized their family were gone. Others ran into the woods as their homes and families were being attacked. They began walking to refugee camps in Ethiopia. They wandered for months without mothers or fathers towards the promise of safety. In 1991, they were forced at gunpoint to leave their refugee camps in Ethiopia because communists had overthrown the government. Many survived river crossing for more than a year uh, wandering back through Sudan to Kenya, but some, many of them drowned or eaten by wild animals. Because they did not have water or food, they had to drink their own urine and eat mud and strange food such as leaves and bark in order to sustain life. Many died of hunger, disease, and animals attack. Survivors relied on each other but later helped them enjoy the months of wandering. Little ones became too weak or tired to continue. The older boys would pick them up and carry them. They became parents to each other. They traveled anywhere between 700 and 1,000 miles. In 1992, uh, 10,000 to 12,000 survived the journey, arriving at the Kung Fu refugee camp in Kenya. Um, in 2001, because of their condition of the refugee camp, 4,000 boys were resettled in the United States. In this video that I'm about to show you is a story about a lost boy named Salva. He was one of the 4,000 that was relocated to the United States. This is the house I was born in. That's where I grew up. That's where I was born. And I used to play here with my cousin. That's uh, my uncle's house. My grandfather was buried here. Sudan is Africa's largest country. For 21 years, a civil war raged between northern and southern Sudan. Nearly 2 million people died. 4 million were displaced. During fierce government attacks in 1985, amid gunfire and bomb blasts, 17,000 southern Sudanese boys fled into the bush. They became known as the Lost Boys of Sudan. The Lost Boys trekked 1,800 miles across the desert, fending off lions and hyenas, eventually living in refugee camps, first in Ethiopia, then Kenya. During their journey, about 5,000 of the boys perished from hunger, 
thirst, disease, exploding bombs, or attacks by animals and soldiers. The 12,000 who survived ended up in the UN-sponsored refugee camp in Kalkuma, Kenya. In 1996, Salva Duke was one of the first of 3,800 lost boys selected for resettlement in the United States. When I came here, I was sponsored by the Episcopal Church. That's how I get here. And when I came here, I didn't know anything. And when I get out from my apartment, walking about five blocks, I could not remember to go back to my place again. Because everything looked the same. Sal was now an American citizen. He lives in Rochester, New York, and is working on his bachelor's degree in international business. And I have to make sure that I work hard enough to support myself and educate myself as much as I can. And I'm sure maybe a lot of you read about what is going on in Sudan and what happened. During the war time, my dad took me to school. And when he took me there, the war broke out in the night. I depart, and we never see each other again. And I didn't know what my dad was for about 19 years. And when I heard about him, he was sick because of waterborne diseases, and he was in the clinic of UN. He walked close to 300 miles to go to that clinic, and he walked there many, many days to get there. I said I should go and see my dad before he passed away. And when I went there to that clinic, I saw my dad, who was very weak, and I walked to my dad, and I said, hey, dad, how are you? And he said, who are you? I said, I'm Salva, dude. And uh, he was starting with emotion. And, uh, he sprayed the water on my body and said that it's, it's a sign of the welcoming back. He feel like I was dead and I'm coming out from the tomb. The doctor told him that he need to start drinking clean water. If not, he might get sick again and get some uh, waterborne disease again and might die. When I went back to U.S., I said I should do something to help my dad and other people who are in the same situation as well. And that's where I formed a non-profit organization called Waterfall Center, and that's why I'm here today. And now he's drinking clean water, he's healthy. I was studying it because of him, but I find there was so much need for others. And if you help them, these people someday, they may help others. And that's what really gives the energy, because it's helping the life of the people. Yeah. Unicef was able to reunite uh, 1,700 other boys with their family, but many of them, many other boys never saw their families. Although some children were able to leave and go to other countries, many children were at risk in terms of other methods of survival. Um, the children that were at risk were uprooted from their homes and their communities. They were eternally displaced as refugees. They were orphaned or separated from their parents and families and it was subject to sexual abuse and exploitation. Um, the victims of trauma as a result of being exposed to violence, deprived of education and recreation. Um, they were deprived of basic needs such as shelter, food, and medical attention. So the SLP um, recruited them from the refugee camps. Although many were forced to fight, many joined willingly because they saw no future in the refugee camps. Many died on the battlefields or in, a, or in the camp because of the bad conditions. Many children who survived were left with physical and psychological war injuries. Many things have changed since the beginning of the Second Sudanese Civil War. As of 2011, Sudan became two countries. On January 9, 2011, 98.83% of people from southern region voted to become its own country. 
They, get, they gain their independence as one of the most fragile and undeveloped countries. 50% 50, 50 of the population live below the poverty line. The past to, long, to lasting peace will require addressing current and past problems. Corruption, political party reform, intercommunal violence, and tension over oil sharing revenues with Sudan. Only time will tell if this young nation will survive. My final thought, after every genocide since the passing of the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights, the words never again has become an outcry among many nations. Promising the people of the world genocides promising the people of the world genocides will never happen again on our planet, but it keeps happening. Since 1940, since 1945, the end of World War II, 20 plus genocides has occurred, um, such as Somalia in 1988, Ethiopia in 2001, Uganda in 1972 and Syria in 2011, which could continue to go on. When our elected officials were asked why they haven't done anything about the genocides, many stated they are concerned about, only concerned about what the American people are concerned about. Question for, to, for you today, are you concerned about what is going on in the world and what should be done? Dayu stated nobody agrees on exactly what to do, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do nothing. At the very least, Dayu believes we should educate ourselves about what is happening. I'm going to take it a step further. I challenge you today to get involved, write or call your local representative, and ask them what are their stands on genocides and what are they going to do to prevent them. Although the genocide of South Sudan has ended for now, genocide in Syria is still ongoing, and we must, as American citizens and citizens of the world, must let our Lawmakers know where we stand. Your voice has power, and it's time for us to stand up and use that power. Thank you, Sade, for your presentation today. Uh, she put a lot of work into her research, as you can know and challenging us to take a look at what is going on in the world. Uh, it's too many times we look at what's going on in maybe our handheld device, and that stays current to our particular interests. But through this intercultural lecture series, we would like to uh, challenge you to look beyond our local community and support those who are making these presentations. And thank Shade today. Uh, I know that she has a handout that would give you the, um, the addresses of senators and congressmen and those that you could contact. Uh, you could either send her an email or send me an email. I'm Penelope Stickney, for those of you who, most of you know who I am, and we'll be sure you get that. She had asked me to print that for today, and I hadn't seen that in an email, so I apologize. However, if you email for it, you'll get the electronic version, and then you're not typing out the addresses, you're clicking on it, and you can write your letter. So we save you another step. Now, does anybody have any questions or comments on this material today? What did he do when he, uh, when he started the water? It was actually, it allowed them to have clean water because like, as you saw early on in my lecture, it was like a lot of flooding and stuff. So they didn't have clean water. So he, uh, clean, purifying the water allowed them to have like clean water so they could be healthy. How many places do you think are still without clean water? In Sudan, there's a lot. All over, I mean. Oh, in Africa, there's a lot of places because there's other people I don't know if you read in the news that are starting an organization called Clean Water that allow for other places to have what he's doing. Why did you pick this topic to present? Um, when I was at St. Joseph College, we did a core lecture called um, Africa. And so I was interested in um, what was going on in our world. And 
I actually want to join the Peace Corps, and I'm looking at going to Africa. Thank you, Sade. <laughs> Listening to her lecture today and in our conversations, uh, brings to mind two instances where I've had opportunity to know young men who, are, who came here uh, from Sudan who were among the lost boys. Probably 13 years ago, I had a student at another community college where I was teaching essay comp writing, English writing, and this young man was in the class. He was uh, studying auto mechanics that was what he was wanting that to be his forte. And when we had our um, essays that had to, to challenge a topic, he was determined to say that European cars were far better than American cars and everybody should drive a European car. Well, this was at a school in the state of Michigan and I challenged him and I said, you know, I don't think our audience would want to hear that. But he was so determined. And in the course of our conversation, I learned that in the, the first uh, civil war, in one of the first bombs that were sent off in his community, he was separated from his family as a child. And he traveled and walked the world in his world until finally people started to collect them and connect with them. And eventually, he was sent home. His whole family had survived the war, except for his grandmother, who was killed in that bomb attack. Some years later, and not too many years ago, maybe eight or ten years ago, I got to know another young man, uh, much younger than the first one, who was sent here to study by his family, who said, you're going to America to get your education, and then you can come home. And to return to the first student, he said to me, I was very angry. I had been too long away from my family. I did not want to be sent away again. And he said, I told my father I was not going to go. My father went into the house, slammed the door, and even though we were in the same home, he didn't talk to me for two weeks. And I realized I had been um, uh, impolite to my father, and I finally conceded that I would come to the States for education. But he said, I am so anxious to return home. Now granted, he was in his first year when I met him, and I hope he's home. I hope he did well. The second student, a few years later, was here because he was adopted from one of the orphanages. And the first time I met him was with some friends at a dinner, and then the second time I saw him, maybe about a year later, he had tracked down his family. So even though he lived most of his young life and was raised here in the States, he was able to go back to his village and see his family. He had planned about a week there, and uh, yet he realized that under the conditions of safety for his family, he could only be there less than a day. He said he was very saddened by that. And then he had to find some way to keep himself busy in the cities until he could catch his airplane and return back to the States. And I remember him more clearly because he's uh, uh, more current in my life. And just an amusing anecdote, his name is Shop. He goes by that name, Shop. His um, real name is, uh, I told you that the other day. Peter Pan. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I didn't know him by this name. His real name is Peter Pan. And he said he would talk to people on the phone for a job interview or for school or something, and they'd say, who are you? And after about three or four times of him saying Peter Pan and people hanging up on him, he went by his middle name of Shop. Well, that's still a Shop Pan from our point of view, but he at least has a lot more support in his phone calls. What I'm saying here is we don't know who's in our world. We don't know whose paths we're intersecting with. And a little bit in these lectures, as students present them this year 
and we hope they will again next fall. We might find that we're crossing paths with someone we should know and some story we should know about. So again, thank you, Shadi. I know it's not easy. To do. <laughs> thank you for coming. Please be sure you signed in. And there's some of you I'd like to meet out here. Who's out here? Who's here? Uh, if you want to wave or stand up. <laughs> my advisor from St. Joseph College, Dr. Wistrom, and my English professor, Dr. Tobin. Excellent. Thank you for coming in today for Shadi. Yeah. It's wonderful. Okay. All right, have a good evening, great weekend. I'll see some of you tomorrow. Okay. Oh, it is. Yeah, hold on, I'm gonna turn it off. I think it was that. What was that? Mm. <laughs>